It's Greg Brown. Welcome to flight number one of the Flying Carpet Podcast. Many of you know me through my long-running Flying Carpet column in AOPA Flight Training Magazine, or you may have read my books, Flying Carpet, The Soul of an Airplane, The Turbine Pilot's Flight Manual, The Savvy Flight Instructor, You Can Fly, or Job Hunting for Pilots. I am a former National Flight Instructor of the Year and also a former Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. Finally, some of you may know me from my fine art aerial photography, which has been widely featured in magazines. I've had a few museum shows, and I offer those prints for sale along with pilot achievement plaques to celebrate first solo new certificates and other pilot accomplishments. For those not familiar with the flying carpet, it's a Cessna 182, four-place single-engine airplane. I've owned it over 20 years. In it, my wife Jean and I have flown all over the continent, searching behind clouds for the real America. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of what we found, along with our many flying adventures along the way. You can learn more about all of those things at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, and I hope you'll consider joining me for my social media pages, which you can also find by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet. If you're involved in flight training as a student pilot or perhaps working on advanced ratings or as a flight instructor or even like to mentor pilots coming up the ladder, you might consider joining my Facebook group, Greg Brown's Student Pilot Pep Talk Group. Be sure to answer all the questions if you apply to join. Okay, let's get on with today's episode. Clear prop. Due to the COVID pandemic, many of us have been sitting around the last few months wishing we were back in the air rather than actually flying. And I thought it would be neat to kick off this series with a story that sort of relates to that. The story is called New Beginnings, and it actually came together following the 9-11 grounding of all aircraft in the United States. Back then, like now, We were suddenly grounded with no indication of if or when we would ever get back in the air. It was a traumatic period. And then there was that special day we were returned to flight. And that's what this story is about. And I think you'll find it's relevant to what we're all going through right now. There have been two first flights in my life. These weren't first flights in the sense of first solo, first time soaring, or first balloon ascension, though such milestones were memorable each in their own way. Rather, they were moments when I discovered fresh and new the pure joy and freedom of flight. The first of those experiences occurred in a banking turn, flying a Cessna 150 over the cracked ice and windblown snow of Lake Mendota in wintertime at Madison, Wisconsin. I don't remember if it was as a solo student or a new private pilot, it it really doesn't matter. But at that instant, I escaped for the first time the nagging traumas of becoming a pilot and the consuming minutiae of doing what pilots must do to remain aloft. I found myself seeing through the eyes of a bird, soaring with other birds over a landscape I'd never before experienced in quite the same way. Instead of fearing the terrain below as a threat to be avoided, I noted with fascination sailing ice boats and ice fishing tents among which I'd skated between college classes in wintertime. While skating, I'd experienced the fast-moving ice boats only as flashes of color passing me by. From the air, however, I could see their forward progress across the lake and the paths left by their runners for miles behind. The pressure ridges that blocked my progress when ice skating could now be seen in their entirety. Cracked and buckling, they formed huge rational patterns stretching for miles like spider webs across the lake. I soared and gazed, soared and gazed, and knew that day for the first time that I'd achieved the ranks of birdmen and would never be cured. (music) 
my second first flight occurred on a summery autumn day just short of 30 years later, three weeks and two days after twisted souls hurled peaceful airplanes against skyscrapers. At first, the grounding of all things flying seemed appropriate in homage to those who had died and revulsion to the dark turn taken during the normally beautiful act of flight. For days afterward, I walked our quiet street, gazing up in wonder at a tranquil sky, never before seen devoid of airplanes. I'll admit to enjoying the peace of it for a time, and finding myself content with the quiet and solitude afforded by empty skies. But when airliners were again released to fly, my mood changed, and I was soon overwhelmed with jealousy. Overhead, airplanes traversed skies I was no longer allowed to tread. As days passed, sadness turned to depression. Then hopelessness took over as I realized that such a part of me might be gone forever. There had been other disruptions in my flying over the years, the Arab oil embargo and the air traffic controller strike among them. Although challenging, none had ever been like this, threatening the very freedom of flight. The flying carpet between whose wings I'd spent so many happy hours was now no more than a throw rug. What if she were destined to rot amid cracking royal light and flattening tires, like other poor derelict airplanes I'd seen fading in airport corners over the years? To me, neglected airplanes seem as melancholy as down-and-out people. These lingering visions of decay saddened me to a degree I wouldn't fully recognize until later. On this particular sunny day, however, I found myself unexpectedly released from my cage. Only instrument flying was to be allowed for the time being, but that was still flying. Tears filled my throat as I turned toward the hangar. Like other pilots, I suspect I had been unable to face my flying carpet since those unfathomable events occurred. There is a shame in being a part of humankind that an airplane would never understand her mission of flight being so simple and pure. The flying carpet was covered in dust when I opened the hangar, her cockpit stale as I had never smelled it before. Instead of the usual rich, welcoming fragrance of leather upon opening the door, only the slightest hint of drying leather was traceable in air tinted by mustiness. Compassionately, I pulled the neglected craft into sunshine, recharged her tires, and cleansed her windshield. Were those tear streaks marking the dust of her acrylic, or just bug trails from flight in a long-ago life? As the engine croaked, then stuttered and rumbled to life, my heart warmed at having saved this bird from the clutches of death. Rarely do we fly instruments in the sunny southwest, and as I collected my flight clearance, I sensed the strangeness of it all. I'd lived here in Arizona for 13 years, and it was my first instrument flight outbound from this airport. I was headed for Flagstaff to see my son, Hannes, a destination to which I'd flown so many times before. This time, however, I would not fly direct as in the past. Rather, I'd be routed northwest over Phoenix, then follow a circuitous series of airways via Prescott. I taxied for takeoff. My favorite part of flying is when we taxi out onto the runway and line up with the center line. How appropriate that my other son, Austin's words, should greet me at this particular time. The young man had departed only a few months earlier to follow his calling at the Air Force Academy. While filled with pride at both boys' accomplishments, I deeply missed their company. Nowhere was the void greater than in the adjacent empty pilot seat. I relived Austin's words after savoring the engine run-up. Even the usual noisy gyro threatening failure didn't bother me this time. I urged the flying carpet down that center line, and she flew. That's when I experienced my second first flight. Climbing over familiar terrain after weeks believing I'd never fly again, I felt anew the grace and privilege of soaring with hawks. Compounding the sensation was knowledge that tomorrow it could all be taken away again. How we've been betrayed, I thought. 
In the backlash of terror, I'd been chained interminably to earth, constrained by people to walk around uncomfortable like a bow-legged cowboy off his horse. Fortunately, what might have been a life sentence was now for the moment commuted. Welcomed by blue skies as I ascended toward the Bradshaw Mountains, I again felt all that was flight. There's comfort and beauty in flying over familiar terrain. Those rooted to the ground imagine aviators fluttering lost from one teetering branch to another, closing their eyes and setting out like messages in bottles for points unknown. We pilots know that's not how it is. Every town, every mountain, every lake and river is connected to another in continuum. Flying familiar country is like tracing the body of a lover. Aviators over time grasp the true shape of every pond, the course of every railroad track, and where each road and gravel lane may go. Ranches lie hidden in mountain valleys far off the highway. But no matter how secret, we've been there. Yet also like a sweetheart, even the most well-known hills and valleys never become so familiar as to preclude a new adventure on every trip. Each unique palette of clouds, time, and light paints a fresh perspective. Looking down, I noted progress over the village of Oak Creek. I'd never set foot in the place, yet in some respects knew it better than its residents. How the town emerges from Vermilion Buttes when approached from the south, the pattern formed by its streets, and the true meandering of its namesake creek, not just the view from occasional road crossings seen from the ground. Moreover, I knew the community's true location, how and where it really lies relative to its red rock surroundings and the human fabric connected with it. Flagstaff's position I soon recognized from long familiarity, well before seeing the city itself. Slowly it materialized as expected in the great shadow of snow-covered Humphreys Peak, the tallest mountain in Arizona. Hannes was waiting to greet me at the airport. We drove downtown as so many times before and dined al fresco at our favorite sidewalk cafe. It was there, sipping fruit smoothies in the shade and talking music with Hannes, that I finally felt whole again. Behind me in my logbook was the equivalent of 180 work weeks in the air. I had believed it was over. But now, in the rich company of my son, I knew there was at least one more glorious flying hour to look forward to. The journey home. What more could I ask? Always I'd envied the boundless joy of new pilots. Now I would be one again. Thanks for joining me for today's Flying Carpet Podcast. I have lots of plans to expand this in the future and look forward to seeing you at upcoming episodes. Please stop by gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. Check out my books, which include stories like the one you heard today and also my views from the flying carpet aerial photography which I offer very affordably in prints and also pilot achievement plaques to celebrate your accomplishments like solo and new ratings. Music for this podcast is by Hannes Brown. See you all next time. <laughs>